Hello once again and welcome to the Pokestars.net European Poker Tour. It is Thursday the 14th of March 2013 and it is day four of the EPT London main event. This is a tournament which attracted 647 players from 58 countries. That generated a prize pool of more than £3.1 million. Pounds. And we started paying players yesterday. The bubble burst when we were down to 96. Today we are down to 32. Four tables of eight players. That means everyone is now guaranteed at least £15,000. But of course everyone Everyone's principal objective is to make the final table and put themselves in contention to win the title, the trophy and first prize here at EPT London of £700,000. In contention for that title, three former EPT champions, plus three former EPT main event runners-up and two members of Team Pokestars Pro. Let me take you around the room. Our final four tables. Table one, directly behind me there, features Mantis Vysotskis. He's the Lithuanian player who came into yesterday as the chip leader. We've also got Yuri Guli. He's a Russian player who you may remember went deep in EPT Deauville, the last leg of the tour. We've also got Ruben Visser, a former member of Team Pokestars Pro, who made the final table at the PCA in 2012, and Theo Jorgensen, one of the two members of Team Pokestars Pro. Great to see Theo back on the tour. Now, table two is on the main stage. That's our feature table. Two of our former champions are sat at that table, Mike McDonald and Nicholas Schwiti, plus two of our former runners-up, Annette Oberstad and Steve O'Dwyer. I'm sure you're familiar with many of these faces from our live coverage over the last few days. Table three, that is Table Mercia. Jason sat directly behind me here and when you ask people who is the player most likely to become our first two-time champion, the three names that normally get mentioned are Mercia, McPhee and McDonald. And interesting to see that two of those three guys are still alive on day four of this tournament. And then there's Table four over my left shoulder, which includes Steve Silverman, the today's chip leader, the Finnish player Passi Sormanen, who comes into today with more than 1.5 million in chips, plus tournament beast Chris Mormon and Rory Matthews. Well, I'm joined now by Rick Dacey, staff writer at the Poker Stars blog. And Rick, due to the random nature of poker tournaments, when we get down to the final 32, it's rare to have a field with such high calibre. Sure, you're normally looking at maybe a quarter at most that are sort of known players. Here, it's a vast, vast majority. And even those that aren't big names still have a lot of credentials and, uh, and a lot of good poker knowledge backing them up. For instance, Ruben Nanev, who's at the final table, he's won two EPT side events. And, it, you know, he won't be known by anyone else. So there's a lot of quality in this field. A storyline that continues from Dover, actually it continues from the end of last season. You may remember in the Season 8 EPT Awards, Lebanon received Country of the Year and it was very well represented during the late stages of EPT Deauville, very well represented here as well. Yeah, it's quite incredible. Lebanon's got a population of like four, four and a half million and they're producing poker players at an alarming rate. Uh, you've got Moussa, Dyer and Nicholas Chiti, who was a previous EPT Grand Final winner. So. Uh, Cheetah is very much in the middle of the Venn diagram here and uh, is likely to go very deep. So action's just underway. 32 players. Our objective today to get down to the final two tables? Yeah, uh, we play down to 16, which according to Toby Stone, the tournament director, should take approximately four levels. Obviously, that could stretch, but they're starting pretty deep here. 60 big blinds, which is a lot at this stage of the game. I think the caveat that's been issued is if we play five levels and we still haven't got down to 16, we'll end there, whether we've got 18, 20, whatever. Um, we should talk about the atmosphere here. I mean, sure. we talk about the EPC going back to its roots. It's very rare now to have a European Poker Tour main event on one of our festivals in an actual casino. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's great. It's going a bit old school, but um, it, it is brilliant because there's lots of side events, there's lots of cash games, and it is split across two venues, but that really hasn't, uh, in my opinion, tarnished it at all. It's, it's been great. Uh, it's across two floors here, and obviously, if people want to tilt off a little bit at a roulette table, they can. Uh, I wouldn't advise it, though. No, and there is also a craps table just before you leave the exit. Very strategically placed by the Grove Victoria Casino. Uh, finally, you mentioned the side events. There are a big side event kicking off today here at the Vic, and that's the 10K High Roller. Yeah, that kicks off at 4pm, and you can get live coverage on the PokerStarsBlog.com. And the 10 game, uh, sorry, the 8 game 10K is also going on, so look out for updates about that too. Thank you very much, Rick. Remember, PokerStarsBlog.com is your friend. Follow the guys at PokerStarsBlog on Twitter. Let's get to the action at our feature table now. Over to me, old mucker, Joe Stapleton. Thanks a lot, James. Thank you, Rick. There is our feature table. Let's meet some of the players you can see down to the last 32. This is one of the four remaining tables. 
And there is our lineup in the one hole. George Matinas from Cyprus. We watched him play uh, quite a bit yesterday. Kind of impressive, actually. Guy we really haven't heard of before. As uh, James and Rick mentioned, in the two seat is Ruman Nanev. And not only has Ruman uh, done well in the side events here, but he's also a live satellite winner. So he's on a, kind of a free roll at this point. In the three hole, Frederick Anderson from Sweden. Number four, Mike McDonald, former EPT champ, sitting right next to him. Nicholas Schwede, former EPT Grand Final champion. So we will be pulling for those guys, for those storylines there. In the sixth seat, Annette Oberstadt, as James mentioned. Runner-up finish in EPT event. Also the youngest World Series of Poker bracelet winner of all time. Won that WSOP Europe bracelet. And uh, she is among the shorter stacks, as is the other female left in the tournament, Hui Chen Kuo. She's got less than 16 big blinds left, so uh, we'll be watching her stack very closely. And of course, Steve O'Dwyer, the American in the eighth seat. He was the runner-up at EPT London the last time we held this event. And there they are, ranked in order of chip stack. You can see Nicholas Schwede leading the pack at our feature table, 114 big blinds. And all the way in the danger zone, Hui Chen Kuo. Like I mentioned, just 15 big blinds there. Action is underway. Blinds are five and 10,000 with a 1,000 ante. Action this hand will begin on Nicholas Schwede, who also won a 1K No Limit Turbo event. It was a deal in that event, but uh, he scored 21,000 pounds in a side event earlier this week. Schwede folds under the gun. Oberstadt out. Quo out. Looks like Steve O'Dwyer is going to open this pot. Makes it 24,000. A little less than 2.5x. And it folds. Over to Anderson in the big blind. Doesn't care for it. He kicks it in. Steve O'Dwyer is going to raise and take it at our first televised hand here. Welcome James Hardigan back to the booth. Nice job down there, James. Thank you very much, Joseph, and well done for calling the first hand of the day all in your own sum. Yeah, it's, uh, I threw up a little in my mouth. I was so nervous, but uh, we got it done. So our two former champions sat directly next to each other. Shweeti, one of the big stacks in the tournament, biggest stack at this table with 1.14 million. O'Dwyer, also a contender with 841,000 at the start of the day. to say it is great just to reiterate the point that you've mentioned and that uh, I was discussing with Rick Dacey to see so many familiar faces so many big names still in the field at this stage It's like we have an open shove from Quo. <laughs> Not often we see the Chinese flag. And she has been called because Matinas has stuck in 149,000 from the cutoff. So her 15 big blind open shove called by the Cypriot player who final tabled the special seventh anniversary Sunday million a couple of weeks ago. She is at risk. She is ahead, however. Cards are on their back. Ace Jack against Ace Queen. Quo the player with the Ace Queen. Not a great flop for Ace Queen, but it is still ahead. Matinas picks up three more outs. Not quite yet. Three more outs. Not quite yet. King on the turn. Looking pretty good for Ace Queen now. Maximum tension as the river card is dealt. It's a complete blank. And so, Hui Chen Kuo will double up through George Matinas. Hello to Dorothy on Twitter, who says, two women on the feature table again. Awesome. Hashtag women for the win. And Niels says, fun fact, just shy of 19% of the remaining players are Scandinavians. Let's go, Theo Jorgensen. Sparta Couscous claiming that this is Matinas' first ever live tournament. 
So a reminder that we've kicked things off at 1 p.m. Central European time and we'll follow the action through to the end of play, uh, either when we get to 16 or when we played five levels. We'll also start at 1 p.m. Central European time tomorrow and for the final day. And plenty of localization now. You can watch in Mandarin on pptv.com. Our Russian friends continue their coverage on Pokestars.tv. Today, we start streaming in French and Portuguese. Bonjour. And for the final two days of the tournament, we've got Belgian streams and a LATAM Spanish stream. All the details available on your screen right now. Those two streams, uh, three streams, start tomorrow. Cherry pickers. Amazing to think, by the way, that Matinus has gone this far in his first live event. And this is a really tough tournament to go deep in. You know, that used to be something that, uh, you know, in the poker media we would focus on a lot. It was one of those go-to questions. How do you how do you find the transition from online to live? And is it a problem handling chips and masking your tells? And, and really, it seems like a lot of the best online players don't really have that problem. It's just a pretty smooth transition these days. We've spoken to a lot of the pros and a lot of the guys who've come in to do guest commentary through the week, and most will agree that EPT London is one of the toughest legs of the tour. So Matinus is raised from the hijack, flatted by Nicolas Schwiti in the big blind. Schwiti checks. Matinus betting into the table chip boss. 22,000. 1,000 more than the size of his pre-flop raise. <laughs> Sweetie calls. Five of hearts on the turn. And as expected, Matthias slows down after getting stationed on the flop. Seven of spades on the river. Let's see if Sweetie decides to take a stab at this now. Yes is the answer. I just realized the yellow chips are in play today. Those are worth 25,000 each. The blues, 5,000. The reds, 1,000. So Shweetie leads the river. And I think Shweetie can be betting a, a pretty wide range here. Obviously, you know, all his value hands, eights. I think you can safely bet a 10 in this spot. Maybe even ace king. Forty-four thousand. Tynus looks like he wants to call. He may have some kind of pair he's thinking of calling with. Sixes, maybe. I don't know if he checks nines on the turn. Shweetie has been called, and he says, good call. Just a bluff from Shweetie, and neither player is going to show. Shweetie mucks, which means Matinus wins the pot by default. A reminder that if you tag your tweets EPT Live, there's a very good chance we'll read your questions and comments. Greg says, psyched for the Brits today. Come on, Chris Mormon. Also rooting for a two-time winner. You can't have both, unfortunately. And Greg says, super excited for the Micro Millions kickoff. That's right, today, the first day of the Micro Millions Festival on PokerStars. See, and this is why I couldn't be back from the Micro Millions. I can't focus on that and this at the same time. Uh, Ricard says, I want to see Victor Blom's table. I don't care that he's out. Give me his dinner table. <laughs> and Yarnamo says, rooting for my fellow countryman, Matthias. Go Estonia. Hashtag best run for Estonia ever. I don't know. I think the way a lot of these guys treat Victor, they would even watch his bedside table. a little creepy, guys. If you're old school and you want to email, by the way, it's nuts at pokestars.tv. Very shortly, we will be joined by Ike Haxton. Yes, 
The team at Pokestars Online Superstar will be with us again shortly, so questions for Ike should be emailed to nuts at pokestars.tv. If you guys are going to watch only uh, one section of this broadcast, no offense to anyone else coming in, but I would make it the Ike Haxton portions because the, the level of analysis that he brings in here, everyone walks out of this room a better poker player after having listened to Ike for a few hours. Well, that hand was raised and take it for Mike McDonald. Cindy Henderson tweets, it's 1.15 a.m. here in New Zealand, but wouldn't miss the live stream for all the sleep in the world. Nuno says, good morning, EPT Live. What a great feature table. Should be interesting. And Andre asks, how did you guys do in the EPT free roll? You don't need to ask. That's my unsubtle way of saying not very well. Alex has written in with a couple of uh, interesting little tidbits. In the grand final high roller 2011, Nicholas Schwede finished fourth. Timex finished fifth. In 2009, the full tilt poker million, Annette won it. Timex finished second. It's really weird that in the final 32, we've obviously got three former champs, but also three former runners up. And we spent a lot of time yesterday focusing on Annette Oberstad and Steve O'Dwyer. I almost forgot. Russell Carson, who has actually made an appearance on our feature table in the last couple of days. Russell was the runner-up in Snowfest in Season 6 when Alan Becker won that tournament. So uh, three guys who've come close, three who've actually sealed the deal, all still in. And, you know, maybe I was in a, you know maybe I was down on the floor doing some stuff when you guys were talking about it, but uh, I, th I don't think we've made a big enough deal about the fact that Steve O'Dwyer was the runner-up last time we were in London. Correct. And it does seem so long ago. It was 18 months ago because, of course, London has actually moved in the schedule just for this one season of the tour. I mean, back-to-back -back deep runs in the same event. Uh, it's incredible. And again, worth reiterating the point that that was Steve's first appearance on the EPT. And he's been a, a, a mainstay, I'd say, since then. Absolutely. One of the more visible American players, for sure. Oh, Joris has just asked an awesomely leading question that our <laughs> colleagues are going to absolutely adore. A uh, small question. Is there a web page where I can see who is still in the tournament? Joris, that web page is pokerstarsblog.com. The widget is your friend. Rob the Hippie King has written in to tell us that Victor left the EPT, was playing online within 30 minutes, lost a quarter mil ball online last night. Yeah, but that's like me losing two bucks. Oh, we'll call it, we'll call it 350. So, O'Dwyer flats the under-the-gun raise from George Matinas. A king 8-7 flop, check to the razor, razor continues. Coding writes in to ask, quite off topic, but do you know how many viewers are watching the live stream? Really curious. Counting you, Coning? At least two. O'Dwyer calls the C-bet. Five of diamonds on the turn. Looks like Matinus is going to go for the, the Hardigan special, a.k.a. the delayed continuation bet. Well, no, he bet the flop. Oh, well, that's not the Hardigan special at all, is it? This is the double barrel. <laughs> that's not the Hardigan special. Who is, who is that? And that's common poker parlance. <laughs> You know, I invented the phrase, chip in a chair. Does anyone ever believe that one? Yeah, like, I had a guy who believed, well, he believed that I was actually claiming it and got angry with me and debated over whether or not I had invented it. And he asked me when, and I told him March 2009, defiantly. And he threw his hands in the air as if that won him his argument. With <laughs> what? Check calls a second time. 56,000 apiece, the ace of hearts on the river. Dwyer check. checks a third time. Is Matinas going to bet a third time? Looks like it. And this was an under-the-gun raise, so I think this makes it, you know, a king a very strong possibility. 
87,000. And I think if Steve was behind before, I don't know if this ace really changed all that much. It might be a situation where they both have kings. If Matinus had a hand like ace-king, Steve was probably already losing. Dwyer with the second biggest stack at the table. He's got about 100,000 chips invested in this pot. He lets it go. So now up to 549,000. It's possible Steve folded a hand as good as a king. Maybe it's just something small, you know, a smaller pair, more likely. A reminder that Ike Action will be here shortly, so email your questions, nuts at pokestars.tv. Keep tagging those tweets, EPT Live. Uh, Reese asks, do we have any Aussies left? I haven't seen or heard of many. I have to be honest, I haven't actually seen any. Uh, Dean says, I think you should have Scotland flags if instead of the GB one. So if Neil Farrell makes it onto the feature table, come on the Scots. To be fair, I do believe that when David Van Plew won EPT London, we used a Scottish flag rather than the Union Jack. But we are using UK, apparently. We're considering it to be one happy family. Inga Christofferson says, woohoo, more live stream. Go ladies at the feature table. Tomek says, one more time, Mike McDonald does his weird betting, and I swear I am done with this stream. Oh, no, please, please don't go. Oh. By the way, Daniel on Twitter is supporting Frederick Anderson, the player in seat three on our feature table. Yeah, he is. Fifth in EPT Berlin in 2012, 11th in EPT Prague 2012, and third in EPT Copenhagen 2012. Boy, that's a, that's a real Frederick Anderson fan there. What do you have for breakfast today? He's made a late position raise to 21,000. I don't mean to be rude, but I remember commentating on two of those final tables. I don't remember Frederick Anderson being there. Uh-oh. Dwyer makes the call from the small blind. Let's have a looky here. Dwyer checks to Shweedy, who checks behind. Interesting. Jack on the turn. Dwyer checks again. Sweetie checks again. Okay, Daniel, you're talking about side events. <laughs> but they're, they're good results, don't get me wrong. But when you talk about EPT Berlin, we're talking about the main event. You have to specify that you're talking about side events, even though you're limited by 140 characters. Even though characters. technically you're correct by saying that he finished third in EPT Berlin, you're leaving out information. James is right. You gotta say main event, side event, what have you. Shweedy finally takes a stab here, 29,000. Steve Mux. Two in a row that Steve O'Dwyer has lost. Down to 715,000, still the second biggest stack at the table. Shweedy, the biggest stack with more than a million, 108 big blinds. And Annette and Frederick are the two short players at the table. Annette with 18 bigs, Frederick with 22. Chris McFadgian says, a day of EPT Live and Micro Millions. Shuffle up and deal, baby. Just remember, there's no burn card. And a reminder that if you want to watch us on the go or you want to play online and actually watch us on your iPad screen, the PokerStars.tv app is available to download for both iOS and Android devices. The lady has tweeted in something that I find rather insulting. She says to us, James, go girls. I think she Which means is the girls at the table rather than the girls oh. in the booth. Oh, yeah, then that makes perfect sense, actually. 
Joe says, could Stapes please remind me of the password for yesterday's easy life free roll? Yeah. Cockfosters. Yeah. Oh, if a joke's worth doing 17 times, it's worth doing 18, right? <laughs> Now, Johnny on Twitter was claiming it's pronounced co-fosters. No. People are shaking their heads. By the way, you know we're talking about Frederick Anderson's results. Oh, yeah. Well, you know I, I double-checked on um, the Hendon mob? Yes. Can you have a look at the picture of the player there and look at the guy who's in the three-seat off each table? Doesn't look like the same guy. Like, not even a little. Like, probably, like, I'd almost bet every dollar I have that it's not the same guy in that photo. Are there two Frederick Andersons? I'm guessing there's probably a lot of Frederick Andersons. Ah. Ah. This Frederick Anderson, by the way, has bet this flop after raising to 21,000 before the flop. Even though he raised under the gun, he's got position on Nanev, who defended his big blind. Nanev won his way into this event in a live satellite. Raises. Anderson was just 21 big blinds left behind. I found two poker playing Frederick Andersons. Neither of them looked like the guy off each table. <laughs> but certainly. Um, the guy who Daniel was talking about with all those impressive results in EPT side events. Not him. Much younger, with flowing blonde locks and a little beard. Well, James, it's possible that this man's had a hard life. So let's not just go assuming things. I mean, look, if he has to keep folding, that hair could go. You know what I mean? Roman Nanev will win that part, leaving Anderson with 162,000. He is now the short stack at the table. And good news, guys. 16 bigs. The Norton protection is now finished on the tournament clock. All viruses checked out. <laughs> I love the way that when it tells you it's finished protecting your computer, it then advertises the fact that you need to renew the license. There's only one virus left on your computer, and that's Norton. Even though 18 adults become cybercrime victims every second, you could confidently use social networks, shop and chat online with Norton. Click on the Express Renewal tab now. And it looks like we've lost a player from the tournament because the clock has ticked down to 31. Or maybe the Norton just kicked in too soon. I mean, not soon enough. And the virus is removing players. Try and get an update from the outer tables and find out who went out in 32nd place. We've still got all eight players at our feature table. By the way, the action has been folded around to Ruman Nanev in the small blind. And he is going to raise enough to put Frederick Anderson all in. I thought it was confusing enough with two Joseph Moorwads in the EPT, but there's three Frederick Andersons. That's just... At least three. Blown my mind. Christian Faulkner asks, where can I get an official Poker Stars red triangle? Do you know what? I do think that you should make these things available in the VIP store. They will be so popular. Why, I do, would I to, why do I have to write an email? I've got a Poker Stars representative sitting directly to my left. Why do I have to put in an email? Christian, your idea will be taken on board once I've written an email. Oh, back in the day when I had a regular home game, that would have been awesome to slide that thing in front of someone. 
By the way, it was Matthias Tekepa who was the player who went out in 32nd. Matthias Tekepa no longer in the EPT London main event. 31 remain. I would like to go buy a bunch of those red triangles and then run down to the tournament floor and just throw them everywhere on every table. By the way, I think the dealer controlled all in triangle is a much better idea than the player controlled all in button. Oh, the 2006 World Series. <laughs> Everyone has a story. Everyone witnessed at least one poor soul moving all in with no hand. <laughs> well, let's pick up the action here. Shuichi raised under the gun. Nanev called on the button. And then the shove from Frederick Anderson in the small. Shuichi asked for a count. It's 15 big blinds. There is the complication for Shuiti of having Nanov to act behind. Now he wants to count on Nanov. Nanov can do some damage. Yeah, Nanov started this hand with more than half a million, more than 50 bigs. Was a button raise though, and you're not going to see people folding their buttons too often. It was a button call. Oh, just a call. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, Shuichi raised under the gun. Oh, that's Nana, very weird. Nana flatted the button, and that's when Anderson made a squeeze shove. That is very weird. Hey, James, what are these yellow chips worth? 25,000, Joe. Oh. Woo! Wow. Nanev reshoves after Shweety called. Shweety calls, putting two players at risk. Jax is the hand for Shweety. Fives is the hand for Anderson. And Nanev has ace king. If Jax hold here, we lose two players at once. And Shweety becomes a huge chip leader in this tournament. Very, very sneaky from Nanev. So Anderson at risk with fives. Nanev at risk with ace king. Shweety with the jacks has them both covered. Club. And a very safe flop for jacks. One club out there. Shweety now becomes almost a two to one favorite. Done. Safe turn for jacks, too. Anderson needs a five. He's drawing to two outs. Wow. And Nanev needs an ace or a king. One card left to fade. A double elimination wow. in the EPT London main event <laughs> as Nicholas Schwiti takes out both Ruman Nanev and Frederick Anderson. Not that one or the other one. The other Frederick Anderson. This one. And Nicholas Schwiti takes the chip lead with nearly 1.8 million. And like that, we are down to 29 players. And a good point to introduce our guest commentator on EPT Live. He's back. You want him, you love him, you got him. Ike Haxton from Team Pokestars Online. Good morning, everybody. What up, Ike? Ike, let's talk about that last hand for a second. So Nick Schweedy obviously wakes up with a, with a monster and, you know, thinks about it for a little bit. Is he thinking about what is Nanav getting a little tricky with here? Maybe... Aces or kings? I mean, there's no way Nick is considering folding the jacks right. when uh, So I guess my when Anderson re-raises. What he's thinking about there is, well, th there are two things he's doing. For one, he's considering whether he wants to just call the shove for 150k or maybe re-raise, probably somewhere around the minimum, in order to give Nanev a worse price to call behind with a hand like ace-queen, king-queen, something like that. Uh, and the other thing he's doing is he's just balancing his timing because suppose mm -hmm. he did have a hand like pocket sevens or ace ten suited or something like that. He is put to a genuine decision there. And if you don't take your time with a very strong hand as well, then you give away information to Nanev who can then make a better decision about whether he wants to go with a marginal hand like ace jack, ace queen, pocket nines after you continue. Okay, and that's something, yeah, that, that was my question, was that, you know, it, there's cer there's like a sort of physical tell aspect to it. Definitely. To, to the tank time. Are you going there? Yeah, but they could move someone in the 
Well, obviously, we'll have some questions for Ike very shortly, but here's an email addressed to Mr. Stapleton, and this comes from Stanislav. He says, great coverage. I wouldn't watch this tournament without commentary. The live play pace is really awful. Uh, I have a question for Joe Stapleton. It's amazing. People are used to watching highlights when they realize how much think time's cut out, Ike. Then it's a whole new experience for them. Uh, so I'm que sure. Question for Joe Stapleton. Judging from your commentary, you should be an awesome player. Is this statement true? Uh, the statement is false. Uh, to, to be perfectly honest, I don't know because I don't really play very much. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think I'm an awesome player. I think that I'm probably a better player than I used to be, maybe even better than the average player. But uh, I'm still learning. I'm, I'm able to talk about it, and I, I, I'm really, I have the benefit of when I have great poker minds in the booth like Ike, I'm capable of asking the right questions, and I can understand what, what they say. But as far as being able to make those decisions in real time, uh, I, I don't think I'm quite there yet. But also, I don't know. I just got back online. I n rarely play live events. I play like maybe two or three a year. And I'm talking like $100 or 100 pound buy-in events. So, um, but no, I would guess not. I don't have, even if I had the knowledge that it sounds like I have sometimes, I don't have the killer instinct. I am so nervous at the poker table. Like you wouldn't believe and I can't pull the trigger, and I can't bluff, and I can't do anything. <laughs> so, no, I'm not an awesome player. By the way, I'd like to thank Alfred for doing some research. He's found 2,214 Frederick Andersons in Sweden. <laughs> 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 and that open shoves. Yeah, we've got a new player at the table. Obviously, we have to balance the tables, and Albert de Haar, one of the Lebanese players, has just come to the table. Really folds a king. And that's all in gets through. Imagine his other card wasn't anywhere near that. Plenty of questions coming in for Ike Haxton. This one from Matthias. Um, Ike, I'd like to know what's the big advantage for high stakes regulars to sit down with around 30 big blinds. Is this just to reduce the variance because they don't have a big enough edge against the other regs? No, it's not just a matter of reducing variance. Uh, very likely he's talking about Potlum and Omaha here. You see that a lot more in PLO than in Hold'em. Um, and there's just an inherent edge for the shorter stacks in PLO because you can end up with situations where you're all in and there are two or more other players in the pot contesting a side pot and one of those players will force the other to fold and that gives you an advantage because once you're all in you're always getting to showdown and the fact that there's more money left to play and the other players can force each other to fold allows you to get 2 to 1 or 3 to 1 on your money preflop and then be uh, sometimes as high as like 40% to win the hand. So there are a lot of opportunities to take advantage of being shorter than the other players at the table. So no, it's not only a matter of reducing variance. Annette, all in, two hands in a row. But this is not an open shelf. This is over the top of an under-the-gun raise from Hui Chen Kuo. Hui Chen with only 30 big blinds to start the hand. Annette shoving for 20. Can't imagine she's raising too light under the gun out of that stack size. Yeah, and so Annette's certainly going to be pretty strong here. So I ace jack and quote spot. Right on the right on the edge. Yeah, I'd, I'd pretty quickly fold ace 10, pretty quickly call ace queen. That is, I, I do think that's right on the border. Uh, she's calling 180 with 60 in there. First guess is I'd fold ace jack off, go with ace jack suited. Well, let's it go. Once again, and that's all in gets through. Ingmar on Twitter says, hey, Ike, will you be playing the high roller event because I've added you in my fantasy poker team? Yes, I will. Oh, <laughs> hell yeah, me too. So that's 4 p.m. that kicks off? Yep. A great tip from Pete, by the way. He says, for anyone driving or on the move, put the stream on, the PokerStars app, on your phone, then connect to your car audio, either via mini jack or Bluetooth, and you create EPT Live Radio in the car. Just don't have the screen visible because drive safely, people. Hot boxing yourself with Staves Hardigan and Haxton. 
Oh, Ike, I think I tried to add you, and you were too expensive. Oh, I haven't been following this fantasy poker thing. How much does Ike Haxton cost? Let's see if I can find him here. Is he more Unfortunately, I have, I have Scott Seaver eating up a third of my budget. Wow, you mildly offended that he went for Scott over you, Ike. A little. Well, he, Scott, he I've, I've had Scott for a while, and I think... The side events count, right? He played the 10k8 game, and I didn't on this trip, so that's pretty big. I don't know if that's actually included in this. Oh, okay. Let's see if I can... ...navigate this thing while we're on the air. Just recapping the action here. Albert De Gea recently joined the table, raised to 20,000. Wee Chen Kuo defended her big blind. And Kuo don't bet the flop for 20,000. De Gea called. Check, check on the turn. River for free. There we go. They haven't added your nickname, Action, yet. I don't know why. I keep writing to them. So she check calls the river. Ace King is the hand for De Gea. Jack nine, the hand for Quo. Uh, what do you think about a lead on the flop there with top pair? I don't mind it. It's not something I do often against an early position raise, just because their range is so strong, you expect them to bet pretty frequently when you call from the big blind. And since you're facing the bet so often, you may as well disguise your hand a little more by just checking your entire range. But that being said, I don't mind it at all. I think y you can construct a good game plan that involves leading that spot a decent amount. I used to do it a lot more than I have recently. Well, after winning that pot, she gets a stack up to 386,000. So, Stapes, have we uh, come to an answer on the Ike Haxton value question? Yeah, Ike Haxton is 114,000. And Scott Seaver is three times that? Yeah, Scott Seaver is like 330,000. Ike, you need to complain to the makers of wow. this game. You're, you're a deal. You're a steal for 100k. Well, it's a market of some sort, isn't it? If people bought me up, then I'd rise, right? Right, exactly. So I think after it's not the maker's fault. People are just not rating me so highly lately. I think after uh, your appearance is here, your price is sure to go up. Absolutely. My tip for the day, buy Haxton! And I also, I would have cashed in Scott to buy Ike except for the fact that you gotta pay 5% every time you sell a guy back so I'm Ugh. paying huge juice to sell Scott back you're stuck with Seaver is what you're basically saying yeah I'm, ba I'm basically he's like basically in fantasy poker makeup for me <laughs> I love that that concept exists well, we're gonna play our own fantasy game here on EPC Live in just a moment let's see what happens in this hand Matinus raising under the gun to 21,000 and meeting some resistance from Nicholas Schwiti Tournament chip leader makes it 46,000. The blinds fold. Action back on Matinus. How's he going to respond to this three bet? Liam says Ike has the coolest voice in poker, both in sound and in content. Agree. Like. I found it's pretty divisive. There are a bunch of people who hate my voice. You pull up like YouTube videos with me in them, and a third of the comments are people saying that my voice is like nails on a chalkboard. <laughs> hate is gonna hate. That's all I have to say, Isaac. Matinus is not necessarily done with this hand. Randall Flowers does an incredible impression of you, by the way. Yeah, the. Randall's Ike is very good. Yeah. That is a call. He had this idea to make a fake instructional video <laughs> in the Ike voice. <laughs> oh, man. Which I'm really disappointed he didn't go through on. It would be Next really time I good. see him, I'm going to, like, urge him to do it. Yeah, I really want to hear it. So Matinus here playing a three-bet pot out of position without the betting lead. Checks the razor. And what percentage of the time is Shweetie going to continue on an ace high flop? Especially uh, such a dry one like this, I think fairly high when he does check here. I'm guessing that's like jacks through kings very often relative to anything else. 
Though another possibility is that he three bet Matanus with a weak ace as a bluff. If he has something like a six here, that would be another reasonable hand to check back. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if he's unpaired, he's nearly always betting the flop. Well, because he checked it back, Matinus now leads the turn. Forty thousand. So it would stand the reason if he had any of the hands Ike was speculating on that he would probably call here. one bet, especially yep. such a small one. Eight on the river. Dry board stays dry. After such a small turn bet, I would expect Matinus to fire again if he's anything other than some sort of medium strength hand. Maybe if he had, maybe he bets once with kings or a bad ace, but it's a very feeble attempt to win the pot if he's unpaired and just bets 40,000 on the turn and gives up. Check, check. Matinus shows deuces. Yeah. Trying to get the check raise in. And Shuichi shows an ace. No such luck. Nice check behind by Shuichi, huh? Very, yeah. Presumably it wasn't a very good kicker with it, but... I think most e people... Even still, Matinus has to be very disappointed to get only like a one-third pot bet on one street yeah I mean that, bottom set there that's a spot where even with a with a bad ace you're gonna go for value most of the time right after the way that hand played out I would think so yeah so most people who are familiar with Nicholas Schwiti would have seen that final table of the grand final back in season six and obviously he came in with a monster stack he ran over the table and yes he ran very well but his instincts also were so in tune on that day He's quite an intuitive player in that respect, Ike, and that's something I respect about him. I, I've i had nothing but respect from what I've seen of his play. You know, and it's actually, James, it kind of speaks to what I was saying before, that, you know, this is his first live tournament. Maybe he has some ridiculous live tell. Like, we, you know, we can't see his face right now. We haven't watched a... Oh, we were talking about Shweetie. Mat Matinus, no. Oh, sorry, but we were talking specifically about Shweetie. No, but what I mean is that Shweetie knew enough to check behind oh, I see. the right. river there. I get it, I get it. Yeah, it's very possible that he picked up something physical there. Good point. So we're asking the question, guys, inspired by the fantasy game about who you're going to pick to win EPT London, EPT London. So we're asking people to pick two horses each. So pick two players from the 28 who remain. We've obviously lost someone in 29th. Let's get word on that ASAP. So of the 28 who remain, which two players are you going to put in your mini fantasy team? So there's the list of remaining players. Someone else has gone. Not sure who it is. Uh, who are you going to take, Ike? Oh, I'm going with Steve O'Dwyer for sure. He's one of my best friends in poker. Two picks. Let's do two picks. Two each. picks. Two picks. Um. Let's go with fellow poker stars pro Teo Jorgensen. Uh, I can't think of anybody who's more owed it by karma at this point. Yeah, that would be. Uh, that's. That would I'd, be I'd love to an see awesome him win. Story. It's a little, little human interest there. Steve would have been one of my picks, but I'll, I'll pick different. Just. Uh, I was gonna go with. I was gonna do Matinus and O'Dwyer, so I'll stick with Matinus. Okay. And. Uh, let's go with Matinus. He's pretty short. Let's go with Matinus and Sweetie. Darn it, you took one of my picks. Uh -huh. In that case, That'll happen. I'm going to go for the other previous champions. I'm all about the two-time champion here, so I'm going to go with McDonald and Mercia. <laughs> Solid choices. James, you mentioned at the beginning of the day that three of the most mentioned names in the Who Will Win two EPTs. Yeah. McDonald, Mercia, McPhee. Correct. Any? Is it just a coincidence they're all M names? No. no, yeah, no it's just no, more no. gratifying to say that when you're asked 
Sorry, no, it's, 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 it is complete Mercier, coincidence. Mercier, McDonald, McPhee. It is complete coincidence. They're just three of the guys most likely to, right? <laughs> yeah, it, those seem like good choices. I don't know. I think there's something to it. A lot of names start with M. <laughs> I'm loving Matt Crocker's pick on Twi Twitter. He's going for Steve O'Dwyer and Steve O'Dwyer. <laughs> oh, confident. Frank says go Ruben Visser, but I'll take Sweetie as well because of his monster stack. Maris is taking O'Dwyer and Mercia. Ben Newman is taking McDonald and Mormon. Justin's taking Mercia and Mormon. I Dan liked Mormon, but he started really short today. Daniel's taking McDonald and Annette. We'll get some more of your selections in just a moment. Let's just pick up the action here because Mike McDonald was shown zero respect pre-flop. His under-the-gun raise called in three spots. And he's checked now. Now, is this a spot where you might give up the betting league, Ike, because, you know, with a board that's pretty wet like this, you're just not really going to get folds from anyone that has any kind of draw? Yeah, betting is a pure bluff here, even as the pre-flop raiser is nearly hopeless, I think. You can semi-bluff with some not super strong hands, you know, just hands that have as weak equity. as, like, ace-king with the king of hearts, or... Ace-10 with the ace of heart, something like that. I think even the bear got shot is probably not strong enough to bet as the preflop raiser there. Sweetie's picked up the betting lead. It's also pretty tempting to check raise a strong hand as the preflop raiser here for the same reason. Somebody's very likely to have connected with the board. Looks like Steve's cutting out a raise here. Yep. I would guess this is some bluffs, some queen jack plus, maybe some queen x of hearts as well. That hand might want to just get it in on the flop. I mean, do you think that with check raising being uh, a possibility coming from Mike McDonald, that that sort of skews <laughs> Steve's range a little stronger? Yeah, definitely. He, he has to worry about both the players still to act as well as Nick. So it, it is pretty difficult to bluff here. But that might could be go what ahead and, so good about it. <laughs> he could go ahead and pull the trigger with something like King-9 of spades or something like that. Anyhow, because, yeah, it does look strong. Either way, I assume well played by Steve. He uh, picks up a... Pretty decent pot there. Well, he looks happy with the result. That's significant considering he lost two decent sized pots earlier on today. Back up over 800,000. Uh, by the way, the news on our 29th place finisher, I can confirm that Giuseppe Sammartino, the Italian no! Pope Stars qualifier, is out. No! More of your picks. Remember, we want you to nominate two players who you think are going to make the final table and potentially win EPT London. Glauer's going for McDonald and O'Dwyer. Vitali says... Vysotskis for the win. Hashtag Lithuania. James, can you confirm that was Giuseppe Valentino? No, Giuseppe Sammartino. Gi oh, no, not really. Giuseppe Sammartino? Yeah. No! Sorry. Uh, Vesali's second pick is Shwiti. Kendrick is going for Carson and McDonald. He says, go Canada, go. <laughs> Ma. Ma, it's, it's Joe. Yeah, they got Giuseppe. Yeah, he's out. Tell Dad. Okay, yeah, I gotta go. A lot of love for McDonald and O'Dwyer, but some other names that people are coming up with now. Peter says Ruben Visser or Raul Rifos. Niels is going to go for Theo Jorgensen or Pasi Sormanen. And Vitali says Nanev looks like a high school chemistry teacher. Hashtag classy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you don't want to be picking Ruben Nanev because he no longer has chips. <laughs> I think I threw a paper airplane at Room and Nanav once. Uh, Kitch wants to check that the stream is actually live because according to the PokerStars blog, Steve O'Dwyer has busted. I can assure you that the stream is 100% live and Steve O'Dwyer is very much in the tournament. If that information was indeed imparted, it was a mistake. Could have been Steve O'Dwyer who also went deep in this tournament. Came in short stacked. <laughs> Oh, Dwyer rules.
time Steve-O makes it 24. Thou. Looks like he's got some action from Matanis. I love Alfred's tweet. Really don't care who wins, just want to see some good poker, but why not a Chinese winner? Would be good for poker. Thank you, Alfred. That's probably true. Chinese EPT winner probably would be good news for poker. My poker girl is going for Annette and for Hui Chen Kuo. The ladies will crush it and make an epic comeback. Did oh. we see Matanis make a much smaller 3-bet than this yesterday? Th this looks conspicuously big relative to what we've seen him do yeah. before. I mean, I guess it's his online heritage means he is a clickback merchant, but this is very much a, a chunky 3-bet. Because I remember you were questioning the size of his 3-betting height because he was 3-betting out of position. Out of position, he made it considerably smaller than that. Now he's in position, making it pretty big. It's kind of like he's got it around the wrong way. Or there's something else about these situations that he thinks is significantly different, and maybe it's just the hand he has. They are deeper in this case than the players in question were when he made the small one yesterday. I think it was 35 big blind effective stacks there. Are there some general summations you can make about someone's hand strength based on the size of their, their three bets? Like if you had to make a guess, would you say this is a stronger or weaker hand? In my experience, when somebody goes for a larger three bet than you expect from them, they have a strong hand, but not one of the very strongest hands. Like jacks? Jacks or ace-king, where they're relatively content to take it down pre-flop and don't want to give the other guy the opportunity to call for cheap. Steve has responded with a four bet. He's made 145,000. Back in the home game, we used to say a bet like that reeks of jacks. We'll see how Matinus responds to this four bet in just a moment. Smurfo says, please interview Giuseppe Sammartino. I don't know if my heart can take it. And Matanis throws it away, so... Probably not his hand that Probably strong. not one of the hands I had just listed. Maybe just a bluff. Looks like it. Steve O'Dwine up to nearly 900,000 in chips. Chuiti still the dominant leader at this table with 1.6 million and may still be the tournament chip leader. A reminder that if you want relatively up-to-date chip counts, and information on the hands from the outer tables. Go to the PokerStars blog and use the widget on the right-hand side. You can also follow the guys on Twitter, at PokerStars blog. Let's just fold it around to De Gea. And he is all in from the cutoff. He is short, just shy of 22 big blinds. And his open shove gets through. Adam says there are two hours to go before the first event in the Micro Millions starts. And what are the chances that it maxes out before then? The cap is 100,000 players, and there are 46,000 players registered so far. That's pretty impressive. And I imagine there's late reg on that as well. Probably, yeah. Alternates in an online tournament. <laughs> More of your picks, by the way. Josh says, Theo Jorgensen is taking it home. And if not, which I highly doubt, then I'll go for Matinus as my second pick.
It's a walk? It is. Still 28 players remaining. Oh dear, Paul Walsh is trying to set his fantasy team and says, can't quite afford Ike. Why? Well, <laughs> in that case, you don't want to go for Scott Seaver. He's like, what, 300? Was it? Yeah, 330. Ridiculous. Patrick's picking Jason Mercia and Quo. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I go Average Joe is picking Victor Blom and Victor Blom. Ike, were you in Deauville? I was not. That's why I bought I, uh, Scott. Scott was in Deauville, right? I bought him before Deauville, and I don't think he was actually there. He yeah, wasn't I don't there. think And then I didn't want to pay the... <laughs> you didn't want to pay the VIG the, to get rid of him. Right. So suddenly you used up a third of your budget on a player who wasn't even playing a tournament. Yep. Matinus is open. Three bet by De Gea for everything he's got. O'Dwyer in the big blind. Folds. Back on Matinus. Something that Boyan picked up on, on Twitter, Ike, and we don't mm -hmm. often talk about seat position enough. He was saying that he felt that Mike McDonald had the worst seat at the table with the short stacks on that side and Tweety on the other side. Looks like we've got a call here. We'll come back to that point in just a moment. Neeners. Nines the hand for Matinus and ace 10 the hand for Albert De Gea. The Lebanese player is at risk and he needs to hit. And this is a race I don't mind seeing. I hate the ace king queens race. I'm glad we could vary it just for your entertainment, Joe. Well, it's just so sick. It's like two hands that you can never, ever, ever fold. And there's obviously spots where you can never fold nines or ace ten, but it's just not as sick of a race. Is that a standard shelf with his stack over the top of an under the gun open eye? I think it's fairly close, especially being next to act with so many people behind him. Uh. I would have to know Matanis' game better than I do to have a really strong opinion. And I, I would guess De Gea does know Matanis' game a lot better than I do. I think those guys know each other. Well, it's looking good for Matanis here. Not looking so good for De Gea. <laughs> it's not a race unless you see all five cards. The nines hold, and we lose Albert De Gea in 28th place. We are down to 27 in the EPT London main event. So back to the point we were talking about just before that hand played out, Ike, and this is Boyan's observation, is that Timex has got the big stack on his direct left, and he had all the shorties on his right. First it was Anderson, uh, then it was De Gea. Does that limit his options? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, when he's the button, it's actually to his advantage for... Nick to have so many chips it makes it hard, harder for him to play hands out of the small blind. But the rest of the time when Nick has position on him, it's going to be bad for Mike that he ha is out of position against the chip leader. And at, e even from the button, actually, in a cash game, it would be good to have the small blind be deeper stacked. But in a tournament when you're just trying to avoid big confrontations to some extent, even there you might not like having the chip leader to your left. And... Also, it is going to be bad to have the short stacks to your right because you have much less flexibility to take advantage of your position against them. Sometimes they'll just be open jamming, which takes away any positional advantage at all. Actually folded to O'Dwyer in the small. And he gives Matinus a walk. Here's a question from Tom. It says, Ike, when is your stack in a live tournament considered to be a short stack? I'm seeing people here shove for uh, around 22 big blinds. You're unlikely to see that online. Is that true? Yeah, shoving for over 20 big blinds, especially from early position, is pretty uncommon online, I would say. Uh, from the button or small blind, less so. I switch to exclusively open shoving at shallower stacks than a lot of people. I'll, I'll still min-raise a lot of the hands I'm going to play down to even 12 or 13 big blinds deep. But I'd say somewhere in the vicinity of 15 is where most people are open shoving more often than they're min-raising. When you're min-raising from a stack that's small, how often are you min-raise folding? Uh, fairly often, okay. yeah. A lot more than never. I mean, especially... 
there'll be certain situations where you're min raising from early position and maybe you're folding if one of the next couple of seats shoves or certainly folding if it goes shove reshove behind right. you right okay Nicholas Sweet is under the gun race so called like by Steve O'Dwyer so on the button hey let's see if maybe we can hear what uh, everyone's laughing about down there I heard Timex say something about someone jump flying kicking. jump kick through a door. It's just our luck. Conversation over. And then I, yeah, I looked it up afterwards, and it was like a completely meaningless game. Like the guy was, you know, maybe the guy was maybe three and a half for eight in like the third highest section or something like that, and it was like it was, it was it was just inconsequential. Like at first I thought maybe this goes like you know a game that determines whether he like you know wins the whole tournament or something, but it was like completely inconsequential. Kind of like that story. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure we picked the right <laughs> moment to <laughs> turn up the table mics. So Nick Sweezy won that last hand with a continuation bet. And it's folded around to Mike. And he gives a walk. And we're down to 26 players, which means there's been another elimination on the outer tables. We'll get the information for you ASAP. I'm just two away from consolidating down to three tables now. Stephen Silverman is the player who just busted. Uh oh. Poor Zagwat. So Steve Silverman's exit in 27th place takes us down to the final 26. And as I just said, when we get to 24, we'll be down to the final three tables. Some like some like dealer commented on his player, you know, something that was like probably out of line, and then he started like grading the dealer, and then the dealer was like, you know, oh, do you want, do you want to do my job? He's like, if the trip tournaments keep going the way they and I will. <laughs> Rob says, hey guys, so awesome you have one of the best in the booth. Can we get more guessing from Ike? Ike, guess which hand Steve O'Dwyer just raised with and took it there. Ah, uh, that would be pretty hard to guess. Any two nine or higher, uh, <laughs> any pair, any suited ace, a lot of unsuited ones. The great thing is that because there are no Hulkar cameras, you can't be proved wrong. So That's he true. says, he's raising there with the Ace of Clubs and the Jack of Diamonds. You can be that specific and no one will ever know. That's true. And Luke has 400 or something like that. And Luke had like five or 600 earlier. And he gets in this giant pot against John. Where basically, you know, John... All right, this time I'm giving him 9-7 of spades. <laughs> Under the gun race from O'Dwyer, 24,000. Please don't do that, because you're going to be right. Just put so much pressure on us for the rest of the day. <laughs> two shortest, the two shortest stacks of the table in the blinds, yeah, yeah, both fold. Excellent situational awareness by Steve to open the 9-7 suited there. You know what I got? I got a jackpot flush. <laughs> the lady has just joined us. Sorry, just came back from lunch break. I'm wondering till what time will they play today? Why aren't you trying to hit a hard target here? We're trying to hit 16 players, our final two tables. But if we play five levels and we don't have 16, then play will conclude then. Which will be about 9 o'clock in the evening, local time. I would guess we're pretty heavily favored to make it down to 16 before that, though. Yeah, so our tournament director, Toby Stone, and Pokestar's live event specialist Neil Johnson predict will play four like, levels today. You know, like around, like like Those levels hours. being 90 minutes long. That sounds about right to me. If not a high estimate. Though I'm sure Neil knows better than I do. Oh, wait, wait until Steve. Actually, I'll just keep the story. Yeah, he keeps going. He's like, he's like, you know, he fist pumps the, like, he takes the fold, takes the call, takes the call, takes the call, walks around the table. It's probably been 15 or 20 min
he rolls around, kicks a chair as hard as he can, it goes flying, and just storms everywhere. <laughs> it was okay. so funny. And me and, me and Phil during the whole time, like, we just, you know, want the pay increase, we're so short. It's just like, call, 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 call. <laughs> <laughs> Did you read about his uh, blow up in day one of this tournament? No. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Yeah, I was at the table. Oh, no, like on day one when uh, some some Spanish kid uh, like in a three bet pot floated in a Luke short checkers. stories, by the way, that's what they're telling here. <laughs> that is a good genre. This kid calls River Blank. Luke checks and the guy bets 10k and like 70k. Yeah. Luke's just like, I ranting and ranting and finally calls 23. Well, raises up to 23 bands. Mm -hmm. And he just goes on a 15 minute rant, just like tearing into his kids. So, like, unbelievable. Well, Steve continues the anecdote, and that Oberstad's all in. Well, it just got serious. Steve's telling the story, which we were telling the other day, that. Luke berated this poor, poor Spanish guy for not playing the hand the way he would have played it. <laughs> there is a write-up of that hand on the Pokestars blog. Mike doesn't look happy about having to make this decision. Credits Maybe a small pair, king-queen suited somewhere in there. I feel like ace-jack calls pretty quickly. I was just going to say credit to Steve for stopping telling the story. So many players just don't show awareness and continue telling their random anecdote when the guy they're talking to actually has a big decision. Steve strikes me as the kind of guy that's well aware of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And especially because uh, if you remember the commentary we just did, they continued to play... Laden thinks throughout the course of his like he had this huge sweat and the super high roller <laughs> whereas like the turn card peels off and Steve just has to fade like one more card so he doesn't go broke in 100k he's like hey guys and it's like Antonio and Durr and Ivy like just jabber jawing he's like uh, guys I know this is like pocket change for you but um this is like a big this is like a lot of money for me so if y'all could, could stop talking so we can get the river card that would be great <laughs> 15 more minutes on the level. Jason Mercier just tweets, can anyone shut Mike McDonald up? We are trying to play poker here, bud. No one is watching the live stream to listen to your nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> nice level, Jason. Under the gun raise from Sweetie. O'Dwyer's called on the button. And it looks like we're going to see a through air flop. No, Mike just calls. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, I thought you... Threw a flop, not through that pot. I misheard you there, right? King, Trey, Deuce. Pretty dry, unlike the Queen Jack 7 flop earlier. I'd expect to see this C-bet quite a bit, including with total air. happy to continuation bet into two opponents. It's a pretty small one, but I'm fine with that, considering the board and the stacks and all. We're going heads Steve up is going to continue very light against that, certainly never folding a pair, and probably continuing with a decent number of unpaired hands. Good A size, even like Queen Jack with a backdoor flush draw might be coming along to the turn. A double barrel is going to get rid of a lot of those hands yeah. you were just talking about, though, right? Yeah, I would expect now Steve is going to need 
a pair or an actual draw to continue. I, I doubt Ace Queen is calling the turn. It's certainly not worse. Though that is a very small bet. That that's just over one third pot. So maybe for that sizing, he does get called by a couple of the better ace highs. Certainly if Steve turned to flush draw with one of his floats, he's continuing with mm -hmm. those hands. Steve does call. But I'd say he's pretty heavily weighted towards pairs, especially kings, by the way. Right, we're, and we're talking, by the way, about the worst hands he'd be calling with, not including, you know, big ones. Yeah, m much more often he just has king queen through king 10 10 on the river so that card definitely can make a difference is king 10 is a pretty plausible hand really for either <laughs> player pocket tens for steve wouldn't be too surprising either also if Sweetie was bluffing. He often pairs the 10 here with something like Queen 10 or Jack 10. So he may have just rivered a sort of medium strength hand and have a hard decision about whether to continue the bluff or mm -hmm. hope to show it down mm -hmm. against a smaller pair. So Sweetie now checks. If I had rivered a 10 in his spot, I do think I'd mostly check. Gulp. 90,000. 90, <laughs> Just under half pot from Steve here. I guess this is probably like King Queen plus for value and some missed clubs, some ace four, ace five type of stuff maybe as bluffs. I suppose it could be even as thin as King Jack. King, I'd be a lot more confident with King Queen than King Jack in Steve's shoes. Queen, boom. Yeah. Shreety mucks, and Steve moves over the million chip mark. I think a river 10 is a very likely hand for Shreety there. Uh, possibly a worse king as well, King Jack, King 9 suited. Just realized you've been neglecting some of your questions. Uh, Dennis says, Ike, what was your first breakthrough that allowed you to become a full-time pro? I deposited 50 bucks online and started playing small stakes limit hold'em and, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, over the course of the second semester of my freshman year of college, I ran that 50 bucks up to a couple thousand and decided I would try to play limit hold'em online as sort of my summer job between my freshman and sophomore years of college. I was starting out with a few thousand dollar bankroll playing around 510 and I made maybe 40,000 that summer and moved up to more like 3060 and starting from there I was still going to school but I was from that point on a pretty serious semi-professional poker player. And you're at Brown? Yeah, I was at Brown at the time. You and Scott? Yep. And Alexis? Alexis. And Mike Graves, which may not be a super familiar name, but he um, does have a World Series bracelet. I, th I know, I remember the name from... Jared Oaken was uh, another friend of ours, that one. Brown. Uh, and did you guys all finish? Yeah. Smart. Use the grape. <laughs> John Garcia says, I come a heads up, sit and go player. Any recommendations for advanced players? Any good websites? And what element of your game do you work on the most? HeadsUpSitAndGo.com actually has a bunch of pretty good instructional videos. Does exactly what it says on the tin. <laughs> Story checks out. Um, the second part of his question is, what do you do to work on your game? What's your uh, what's your method of analysis? I spend a lot of time in Poker Tracker looking at my opponent's tendencies. I think that may be a bigger deal at the higher stakes than at the lower stakes, just because I get to play so many more hands against so many fewer people. But I think there's actually a lot to be done 
analyzing sort of population tendencies of everybody you play against in the aggregate when you're playing at lower stakes. So maybe, maybe you don't get to play thousands of hands against one guy, but you can just sort of analyze thousands of hands. the generic <laughs> guy who sits you at a $5 sit and go, how often is he shoving over your first open 25 big blinds deep? That's a pretty valuable piece of information too. By the way, Rob was the guy who wanted you to do more guessing. He says, Ike rocks reading hands with that king queen from Steve O'Dwyer. <laughs> <laughs> so Mike McDonald raised pre, Annette defended, and a continuation bet gets the job done for Timex. Uh, Michael Ross says, Ike, any more games versus MRGR33N soon? And what are your thoughts on him? Uh, yes, we'll definitely be playing some more soon. I've been kind of taking some time off from online poker just because I've been... I was on vacation in the Caribbean last week, and now I'm in a hotel room in London where my internet doesn't work. So... I'll be back in Malta in a few days, and once I'm there, I will absolutely be playing some more 5Ks with Mr. Green. I think he's very tough. I think he's one of the best guys I've played at Heads Up, Sit and Goes, but I think I have an edge, and I'm excited to play more with him. Steve raising under the gun. I imagine he'd say something similar about me. It's going to be fun to see which of us is right. <laughs> Mike giving O'Dwyer the stare down. He calls. It's gonna be a stare down. Everyone else gets out of the way, heads up to the flop. <laughs> Ace 10 6. Mike, check out the board. firing for around two-thirds spot here. A little under. Bigger than most C-bets we see. Yep. Yeah, that, that's something that I think the handful of guys I talk strategy with do differently from a lot of other top MTT players. Is we bet bigger in a lot of spots than most people in the field do. So Mike check calls the flop. I mean, the most obvious reason to me is that if you know Mike's going to peel a lot of flops, why not go for more value right, right it, away? It's it's a board he connects pretty well with. I think that, and it's a board Steve connects pretty well with as well. I think that you know you can take bigger sizing both with your value and with your bluffs, and you just put more pressure on a lot of Mike's range by doing so. Yeah, Mike with only about half the chip Steve's got. Another thing is that that bet size on the flop more effectively threatens to put stacks in over the course of the next two streets if Steve decides he wants to try to do that. So Steve now slows down. He checks, and Mike McDonald makes it 77,000. Yeah. And I wonder if Sarah Grant from Poker News is trying to find out if Hui Chen Kuo actually gave Jason Mercier his iPhone 5. <laughs> Question for you from Ross Jarvis on Twitter, Ike. Should we have a check raising range when we are the pre-flop raiser in cash games? What spot is this the best play? Yes, you should absolutely have a check raising range as the pre-flop raiser in a lot of spots in cash games. Um, really, more often than not, on any sort of board, you should have a check raising range. Bottom set is a very strong candidate for a first hand to put into that range because you don't block the top pair hands that your opponent is likely to bet with. Uh, some of your very strongest draws and also some of your weakest draws are good to check raise with, both like a gut shot to a non-nut straight or a flush draw with some straight outs. Both of those are appealing hands to check raise with. In the former case, just to take it down and win immediately in the latter case, or, or get the free card when they check back. In the latter case, just for the same reason you check raise value hands in order to build a big pop with a strong hand. 
Now, I don't know whether you saw that, but action was folded around to Hui Chen Kuo in the small blind. So she's playing, what, around 34, 340,000, 34 big blinds. Yep. And she folded King 4 off suit. In the small blind? Yeah. It's a little tight, but not totally unreasonable. <laughs> um, I think my default play is probably to limp it there. I don't mind raising either. If you... What if you're well aware of the fact that you could very easily get outplayed by Steve O'Dwyer? Yeah, I think that's something to consider. If, if she's not that comfortable playing a hand out of position against Steve, it may be better to wait for easier spots. That That's a hand that puts you in a lot of tough spots post-flop. You relatively infrequently flop something you can be super confident is best and just bet three streets for value, so there's a lot of just checking and guessing with your you know, bottom pair with an overcard kicker or top pair bad kicker. If you're not sometimes showing down the king high in that spot even, you're probably not taking full advantage of the strength of your hand. If, if you mm -hmm. don't think you're ever going to be able to correctly get king high to show down, you might not want to put money in the pot in the first place. Oh, by the way, I missed that tweet from Jason Mercer about an hour ago. He has actually taken a picture and tweeted it of the iPhone 5. <laughs> Mm, brand new and sealed. <coughs> she paid up. I think it's a better, a bigger pain in the butt to have to get up and go to the Apple store before <laughs> play starts than to just ship them the, what is it, what does an iPhone cost in this city? 400 pounds? Depends if you get it with a contract, Joe. Well, I guess that she probably didn't get a contract with it. Uh, excuse me, Hui, why is this iPhone spelled with an F? <laughs> By the way, Nicholas has joined the club of people who don't like the way Mike McDonald bets. He says the way Mike McDonald places his chips in the pot is enraging! <laughs> I think there are more enraging bettors out there than Mike McDonald, by the way. I, it, it's a little irritating, but it doesn't, it doesn't I mean, drive me too crazy. Doc is number one. Doc is consensus number one most raging better. I mean, Vanessa Russo makes a similar bet, except her hands another 18, another 18 inches off the table, and the chips go everywhere. Oh, I haven't seen that. Is that a recent development? She I also like puts I played a little, with her and not noticed. She it. also puts a little spin on it. Yeah, as she well. flips them in sometimes. Oh, I don't like that much either. Anyway, Mike's under the gun raise was called in two spots. Matinus was one of the players who called. He defended his big blind, and he led the flop for 29,000. Mike called, Shweeta got out of the way. It goes check, check on the turn. This will probably be the last hand of the level. I should say, by the way, that when we come back from the break, Steve Silverman, who just busted this tournament, will be joining us in the booth as a guest commentator. So if you've got any questions for Steve, Nuts at PokerStars.tv. Best to use the email rather than Twitter because it will just get lost in our timeline. Oh, we're spoiling you guys. Mike Haxton, Zugwat. Come on. Wow, that must be the most annoying PA announcement we've had so far in the last four days. Well, not only is she asking for that fellow within the tournament, but also asking everyone at home. So, Adam, do get in touch. <laughs> Mike betting 66,000 on the road. It's to gonna take be a stare lines. down. All players are welcome to stay box process, however, it's not required. Thank you. So, as you heard, tournament director Toby Stone say there the break will be 20 minutes long. When the players come back from the break, the blinds will be up to 6,000 to 12,000 with a 2,000 ante. Matinus folds the river. Mike wins the last hand of the level. 26 remain in the EPT London main event. We say goodbye to Ike Haxton and wish you luck in this afternoon's high roller. Thank you very much. Fun as always coming on here. Thanks, so man. Back after the break with Steve Silverman. Send those questions to nuts at pokestars.tv as we continue our live coverage of the London leg of the pokestars.net European Poker Tour. <laughs>